morning. My name is uh, Emma Garavaglia. Um, I am part of the project uh, team, and I would like to welcome you to the first uh, session of our workshop. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank Alessandra Gaia and Gabriele Cerati for the wonderful work they did to organize this workshop, uh, and also the PI of the project, Emanuela Sala, for giving me the opportunity to be the chair of this uh, first session. Uh, as you can see for the pro from the program, uh, the title of the first session is Older People, Social Networks, Health and Quality of Life. Hello, everybody. Thanks for um, giving me the opportunity to present a project that I uh, worked together with um, Heather Booth and Mayn Raisi from the Australian National University on. Um, which is titled Pathways to Health, the Role of Social Demographic Homophily and Non-Kin Networks of Older People. Um, we know already that um, there are positive associations between social networks and health, in particular also among older people. However, gerontology has mainly um, focused on, on support, such as um, emotional support, on institutional support to older people or um, on the social network size, the frequency of contacts, and so on. However, there are other aspects that um, should be taken into account as well. There was a um, publication by Lisa Bergman and colleagues um, who um, revealed a theoretical model that also includes um, the structure of a social network. Um, so this means the, the density, so how close the members are within a social network, or um, the homogene homogeneity. This means um, how similar the members are within this network. Um, our concept in, in the study uh, refers to homophily, which is the tendency of people to create and maintain social relationships with others who are similar. Um, you can see that um, this is not exactly the same uh, as homogeneity as suggested in the, in the model. However, it's um, highly connected. Both concepts um, refer to similarity within the social network. And it's also um, obvious that um, high homophily leads to um, high homogeneity. So there's a strong um, association between these concepts. In this study, homophily relates to non-kin networks or friendships. And um, similarity refers to social demographic characteristics. Um, so we created an homophily indicator that is based on multiple dimensions. Um, and that is also clearly telling us um, whether a, a social network can be considered to be homophilous or heterophilous. With this study, we tried to identify the extent to which homophily in non-kin social networks is associated with health. But we also want to look at um, several subsamples based on social demographic groups to check whether there are um, differences in this homophily um, health link between uh, genders or according to um, partnership status, whether there's a partner available or not. And uh, yeah, we want to control, we want to check um, these associations as well. Okay, the um, theoretical base for our study, as I already mentioned in the introduction, is coming from um, a framework provided by Lisa Bergman and colleagues. Um, on the uh, on the on the upper part of this slide, you can see the actual uh, model of them. On the on the uh, lower part of the slide, this is what our um, study can cover, and um, the the framework um, is trying to explain the the pathway from uh, social networks to health. Um, Bergman's model. Um, starts with social structural conditions. Um, with respect to our study, these uh, may mean the social demographic groups, um, sex, age, partnership status, education, satisfaction with living standard, and retirement. These are the uh, characteristics in our study that you can use. And these social structural conditions, they shape already the social network in some kind. Um, this affects the uh, friend network size, for instance, or also the homophily that uh, we are particularly interested in. But we also control for um, family network by including um, family network size, as well as uh, we included an indicator for um, group activities or the duration of group activities in the previous uh, four weeks before the collection of the data. 
um, to control for this as well. And um, the social network um, also obtains certain functions for the individuals and the social network um, provide the individuals with um, instrumental support or emotional support is what we can cover in our study um, which in return uh, affects the health of course it um, determines the mental health the physical health and the indicator in our uh, in our um, study is self-rated health which is a quite good proxy a quite reasonable proxy for um, general health status also um, for mortality rates and so on um, so we expect that homophily in non kin networks um, is positively in, um, associated with uh, self-rated health based on um, the idea of um, creating a social environment um, that is relatively similar that um, that are share uh, interests available um, shared activities um, so this creates a let's say feeling of um, of comfortableness for for the older people the data that we are using are coming from the um, national survey social activity and well-being of uh, older australians by the social network and aging project um, data was collected uh, end of 2010 and early 2011 and a bit more than 2000 uh, individuals were participating in this survey uh, aged 50 years and older this is a relatively small sample um, and also regarding the um, variety of, of topics and um, it is not fully representative for the entire um, older population of Australia um, so for instance um, highly educated um, adults are a bit overrepresented but we control for the educational level as well of course Okay, so the outcome in our study is um, the self-rated health. We decided to make it binary um, with particular focus on um, very good and uh, excellent um, health reported. So um, the, the other categories, poor, fair, and good, they um, belong to the reference uh, group zero in our binary coded um, outcome. The most important um, independent variable in our models um, is represented by the six-dimensional homophily indicator that we created. Um, this is based on the characteristics that I already um, showed you in, in the uh, theoretical part. It's um, sex, age, partnership status, education, financial situation, retirement status. And most of these dimensions were um, collected by the item, how many of your friends have the same sex as you, the same age as you, and so on. Okay, and using these dimensions, we created our um, homophily indicator. Here in this table, you can see um, the, the dimensions, the um, single dimensions listed on the, on the left side of this uh, table and the categories that um, the respondents could answer um, is, uh, is listed horizontally. The values refer to uh, the proportions in, um, in percentage. So for instance, 10.8% um, of, uh, of all the respondents claimed that um, all of their um, friends have the same sex as they do. So regarding the sex dimension, this is a perfectly homophilous um, social network for 10.8%. Um, again, we decided to divide um, this the summit into two um, groups, let's say. Um, the, the answer patterns that belong to all, most, and about the half um, belong in our definition to a homophilous social network, which is a bit tricky in particular regarding the middle um, dimension about the half. Um, whereas the, the, other, uh, the other both categories refer to heterophilous social network. Um, we gave a value one or two to each of um, the individuals for each of the dimensions as um, exemplarily shown here for in, this, in this table. Um, one refers to homophilous um, network in, in regards of, of this uh, particular dimension to, to heterophilous. And then we created the average for um, all individuals who gave uh, response to at least three items so that we have quite a valid base. 
Um, so we, we came out with an average ranging from one to two. And to looking at these uh, averages, we could see that um, there are many, many individuals reporting a relatively homophilous social network. So we were very strict in, in this um, definition here that we only took the individuals who um, exclusively um, always answered um, in a homophilous uh, way to, to define um, our homophilous group. So this means that um, if I go back to the other table again, um, only if the individuals were answering always in the left part of this table, only they are considered to have a homophilous social network over all the dimensions in our case. And if there's only one dimension with a heterophilous answer, um, this uh, means that um, this is our reference category called heterophilous uh, social network. So our homophily indicator um, is binary coded as well for... Uh, Sorry, um, Stefan, you have five yeah. minutes. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so it's, it's binary coded, um, one category for homophilous and the other for heterophilous social networks. Um, other covariates in the in the models um, relate to the dimensions of the correspondent themselves. We also have um, indicators for the friend network size, instrumental support, and emotional support, categorized um, in um, small, medium, and large. Um, and there are uh, indicators for other uh, networks as well, family network size or group network duration of participation also categorized. Um, we also um, control for reverse causation because it can not only be the case that um, social networks um, affect the health outcome, but but can also be that um, health out or that health status can um, restrict the social activities and social networks. Um, and for this, we have also another indicator in our models. Okay, the results are shown here in the um, table for the binary coded logistic regression. Um, uh, for the for the probability of belonging in the very good or ex excellent self rated health group, we want to focus here in this um, presentation only on the homophily um, effect, which is significantly positive. So having a homophilous social network um, increases the um, chance of um, reporting at least very good health by 38%, which is um, a very clear and strong effect, I would say. Um, this this value you can see here in the in the bar chart at the bottom. So the 1.38 that I talked about is um, the black bar for the total sample, but we also checked for um, differences between uh, several subsamples. The most striking result here uh, refers to the educational status. So high educated people um, reveal an even stronger association between homophily and uh, and health, whereas for the lower educated individuals, um, there's well no no difference um, regarding the um, homo or heterophily of the social networks. You can draw the same conclusions for the um, difference between not retired versus retired or satisfied with life satisfaction and not satisfied with life satisfaction. Um, even for the comparison between partnered and unpartnered, although the magnitudes are not so much different, and uh, regarding the other subsamples, um, there's uh, there's no difference um, obvious in, at all. Okay, very shortly, we checked um, interactions um, in, in our model. Um, in general, there are not many interactions, which might suggest that there's a pure homophily effect. Um, what we can, what we could see, however, is that um, there's a weakly significant interaction between homophily and sex among the people who are not satisfied with life with a living standard. Meaning that, um, well, for for females uh, who are not satisfied with living standard, it does not matter whether they are reveal heterophilous or homophilous social network regarding their health, but for males, um, they are better off with a homophilous um, social network. And um, a similar thing for uh, for the male subsample, um, where we could find a positive direction between homophily and retirement status. So if um, males were retired, um, you can not see a difference regarding um, the link between 
the the network structure and and uh, health um however for not retired males it is uh, better regarding their health if they have a homophilous social network okay to sum up homophily is so um, positively associated with self retail health we could see the results ranging from 90 to 53 percent higher probability um, the homophily effect is greater for some subsamples and particularly high educated individuals but also for partners satisfied with living standard and not completely retired i also talked about the interaction effects and to conclude, the, the findings um, suggest that bonding social capital seems to be more important than bridging so social capital in our sample um, regarding health and later life, which is consistent with the socio-emotional selecti selectivity theory. And um, these are relatively, this is a relatively new um, research field, um, and this uh, novel, these novel findings um, require further research regarding other um, cultural contexts and so on. Um, and at the end, homophily um, may help to explain some of the social inequalities in health and well-being, and this is why, this is why um, we should um, put more attention to this association. Said this, I um, end the presentation. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm very looking forward to your comments and suggestions. Can you see my PowerPoint? Okay, that's great. Yes. So. Today, I am pleased to present you some results from our study on the situation of older adults during the COVID-19 crisis that we conducted this spring in the French-speaking part of Switzerland. The main goal of the study were, first, to better understand the experiences, expectation, and fear of older adults during the social health crisis. Second, to make the situation of older people more visible during the crisis and to provide the obtained results to political uh, authorities and association for further use. More specifically for this presentation, the main goals are to present some descriptive data as well uh, as an analysis to better illustrate the current situation and discuss possible inter-individual differences emerging from, the, uh, from these results and during the crisis. Before I talk about the meta-analysis results, I would like to briefly describe the COVID-19 situation in, uh, in Switzerland. The first case of the new coronavirus in our country was officially reported on February 25th. On March 16th, the Swiss Federal Council, which is the highest authority of Switzerland, declared a state of extraordinary situation under the terms of epidemic acts. More specifically, people with particular chronic disease and the 65 years or older were considered as being at risk groups. People were encouraged to stay at home. This means that schools, non regulatory activities such as non alimentary stores, barbershop, restaurants, and so on were closed. We therefore had a, part a partial lockdown. Quarantine measures were gradually lifted from April 27th with situation improving. And finally, on June 19th, the extraordinary situation was officially lifted by the Federal Council. From the beginning of the crisis up to the end of last week, about, we currently count in Switzerland uh, a total of about uh, 48,000 um, 48, confirmed cases of COVID-19. 4,700 hospitalization and about 1,800 deaths. And we conducted a total of 1.2 million COVID tests. Please note that the population of Switzerland is currently about 8.6 million. Unfortunately, from the beginning of this summer, the general trends show a constant increase in the number of newly reported cases. And the last week, the number of new cases was 2,530. However, what we see from the beginning of the COVID-19 related crisis is that older adults have to often be ignored or absent from the public and political debates. And that's why we decided to conduct this study. Let's move to the method of our study. So, our study was conducted in the French-speaking part of Switzerland, which makes up more or less one-fourth of the Swiss population. Participation in the study was voluntary. 
The data were collected from April 17th to June 3rd using an online questionnaire. Participants had, of course, the opportunity to request a paper pencil version if required. Overall, the question proposed items used in a previous survey or developed for the purposes of the studies. The item cover uh, several domains related to this crisis, such as individual well-being, social support, daily functioning and worries, and of course, intergenerational relationship. The analyzed sample was composed of a little bit more than 5,000 adults aged 65 years or older. The mean age was about 73 years and about 60% of the participants were women. Another 60% of the overall sample at a partner, while 35% and 50% lived alone and reported some economic difficulties, respectively. Finally, uh, a little bit uh, about 3,300 participants reported or responded before the first partial lifting of the quarantine measure on April 27th, and the other people responded or participated after this date. So, and now let's move on the results part. Just, okay, yes. Sorry. First, I would like to start with some descriptive data about of, uh, our sample. Overall, data suggests three key findings. First, as expected, the crisis had a negative impact on individuals' well being and daily functioning. For instance, 38% of the participants reported that the crisis had a negative or very negative impact on their mood, on their affectivity, and 27% indicated an increased feeling of loneliness from the beginning of the crisis. Second, despite this negative impact, the older adults were active and remain or remained active during the crisis. For example, they were active giving support to other people outside their household, such as with their grocery or for transportation. Furthermore, a little, a little bit less than 40% discover new ways and new tools to maintain contact with relatives and friends, for instance, organizing a group dinner from their individual balconies or using some types of application like Zoom or FaceTime and other applications that personally I didn't know uh, existed before. And third, according to participant, the crisis alighted for them, the negative view held by younger people regarding the older adults, as well as certain intergenerational tension. Voila. Sorry, it was the. Voila, that's a good one. In fact, about half of the participants assumed that from the beginning of the crisis, <clears throat> younger people held a more negative image of them, and one fourth also reported having been treated unfairly due to their age, or put differently, they were victims of ages. To evaluate possible uh, differences between participants, we conducted a series of analysis of covariance or ANCOVA controlling for self-reported health status. Overall, this analysis revealed <clears throat> a series of differences uh, in terms of the, the well-being, uh, social participation, with concern with the age, uh, the gender, the living situation, or uh, economic difficulties. For, uh, for instance, participants reporting economic difficulties showed a less positive affectivity during the crisis. They also had a strength here a strong fear that they will receive unfair medical treatment. More precisely, we ask if they believe that younger people would receive medical treatment in priority over them. And additionally, they also felt stronger feeling to be a burden for society. All these difference, or all the difference mentioned here, showed here, are statistically significant. Thus, these results are an, just an example of how one experience the, of the crisis and its consequences vary across individuals. In order to um, assess possible variation during the crisis, we conducted a new series of ANCOVA on several well-being and daily functioning measures to compare participants who responded 
before and after the first partial lifting of quarantine measure on April 27. Overall, the analysis revealed that prior to partial lifting, there were a less positive situation in terms of affectivity, fear for one's own health condition, and being treated differently from other people like relatives, friends, and professionals. More specifically, people answering before the partial lifting reported a less positive affectivity, a greater fear for their own health, and more frequently having been treated differently due to their age. As in the previous slide, all these differences are statistically significant. Finally, we conducted several hierarchical linear regression to further examine the relationship among our variables. Here, let's have a look at the prediction of the felt in change in loneliness since the beginning of the COVID crisis. The final model presented in this figure explains about 22% of the change in loneliness variance. More precisely, as you can see, age, living alone, and affectivity negatively predict a change in loneliness is the red bar. In other words, being younger, living with somebody, or having a more positive affectivity are all associated with a decreased sense of loneliness, meaning they felt less, uh, less lonely since the COVID outbreak. In contrast, Having a new uh, context during the crisis, having big victim uh, of ageism, feeling a higher level of loneliness before the crisis outbreak, and having the feeling to be a burden for the families are all associated with a great increase in one sense of loneliness. Regarding the loneliness that's uh, loneliness before the outbreak, which is the strongest predictor here, the results suggest that people suffering a greater level of loneliness before the outbreak are more at risk of feeling additional levels of loneliness in particular situations like a quarantine. And to conclude some take-home messages, as could be expected, the COVID crisis and their relevant consequences had a negative impact on older adults' well-being and daily functioning. However, they were able to cope with the situation and remain active. In other words, they didn't simply endure the heavens in a passive manner, but they react. The crisis revealed and probably amplified existing intergenerational conflicts. Which Sorry, Christian, you have five yes. minutes. Thank you very much, Emma. <laughs> so I would say that the, exist, uh, the crisis revealed uh, some existing intergenerational conflicts, which would could, uh, could be at the origin of this uh, observed uh, ageist attitude. You can, for example, think about the hashtag boomer remover that was frequently used in some very well-known social network platform to define the COVID-19. But at the same time, all participants reported number of cases of spontaneous intergenerational support and not solely by friends and relatives. Consistent with other crises, all results support an unequal impact of the COVID-19 crisis on people according to one's personal situation and characteristics. These differences are not simply correlated with participant age, but they were related to several factors such as, for example, uh, financial difficulties or uh, living situation. Our analysis highlighted some variation in terms of the experience reaction of the participant during the crisis, so before and after the partial leaving of the quarantine measures. So the question that remains is, what kind of changes will we see in the medium and long term, or put differently, what will be the impact of the crisis as we see now, some months after the first wave, and in the unforeseen future? The analysis also suggests that the crisis may are contributed to the increase in individual differences by accentuating some already uh, existing situation of vulnerability. And for the last for the uh, for the last uh, slide, some last comment here and consideration is for us. It's important to recognize the social consequences of the COVID-19. Thus, we should conceptualize it as a social health crisis rather than simply reducing it as in our country too frequently a health crisis. Furthermore, it is fundamental 
to consider the heterogeneity among other adults. As such, the cutoff, cutoff of 65 years of age is problematic and can have some involuntary side effects such as fostering negative stereotypes about aging and other adults, increasing intergenerational tension, or it may risk denying the individuality of a person. All results underline the importance and the need to think about other adults, not only in terms of their needs, but also in terms of what they can bring, both in times of crisis and in normal time. And to conclude, for us, it's fundamental. It's absolutely uh, essential in the future in order to determine and implement the most effective and relevant crisis management measure possible, it will be necessary to adopt a more comprehensive perspective of individuals and their situation, rather than simply relying on their age as a basis. And that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thanks very much, everybody, and good morning. And these are some of the concepts that I'm going to be looking at um, over this presentation, taking a look at social networks, uh, different types of them, looking at the relationship between midlife and older age, looking to see what's different about rural networks, and bringing in some of the concepts already discussed this morning, um, namely social isolation and loneliness. Okay. So to begin with, I simply wanted to ask, are there connections between social networks, social relationships and well-being? Well, clearly the World Health Organization thinks so because it's down there as uh, a determining factor to um, affect people's quality of life. But of course, we know this anyway, because it's a very human need to interact with the rest of our tribe. We are we're pack animals, if you like. And uh, this is illustrated by one participant here, and I will be um, citing some um, some quotations from people, participants in Sweden and Ireland. And her point was that um, social relationships are about more than just giving out and receiving information. They are also about a uh, co-creation of, of ideas and of dreams and experiences. And there's some documented evidence in, in the literature that older women value social networks more than their male counterparts. And this may be the case, and it may be the case for a number of reasons. You know, one, that women tend to live longer, and it could be possible that we build up a, a cache of social capital across the life course from a much earlier stage of the life course in preparation for older age. Uh, it's well documented also, of course, that social networks um, can boost resilience and health capital and very much guard against ill health, both at mental and physical levels. Um, but they're also very well known for boosting self-identity and belonging within communities and relationships and giving us a life purpose, something basically to get up for in the morning and adding to our well-being. Uh, and here's another um, participant's quote here saying that this was a lady who couldn't get uh, teaching work because of her older age, but took up voluntary work instead in order to relate to other people and offer something. So looking at the types of and quality of social networks that uh, influence well-being, um, it's clear that diverse is best, you know, supportive, inf informational and inspirational, not one type. And there are different types, of course, of social relationships going from sort of close, closer, closest. And we can look at kin are the most obvious ones, our immediate family, which may be narrower and deeper, but may be better for intimacy. And this is illustrated by this Swedish participant who um, was so attached to her immediate family that it was preventing her from moving from her rural place. So we have to acknowledge the fact that um, the repercussions of social relationships is much wider than that because it also influences social place. And non-kin relationships would be tended to be, to be broader and shallower, but offering different things and different concepts to us than, a, than kin does. You know, for example, it may be that they foster greater social participation, um, you know, saying that your friends will take you to places that your, fr that your family cannot and will challenge you, perhaps challenge you more and help you evolve and grow more. Friends, in fact, are the family that you pick for yourself, as one um, Ireland participant stated. 
So I found that there was, in fact, of course, a very strong correlation in both Ireland and Sweden between social networks and well-being. But there did appear to be um, nuances within that in so much as networks with kin appeared to be a little bit stronger in Sweden uh, and networks with non-kin uh, appeared to be stronger in Ireland. But of course, I have to take these into context and not generalise from them because these are quite small samples. So is well, I mean, we talk about well-being as if it's a given, but is well-being actually the same for everyone? It's a very subjective term, as I think has already been acknowledged. And these are some of the definitions that come up for well-being. And we can see that these are all going to be very different for different people. Um, it's not well-being is not the same for everyone. It's very dynamic, and like a lot of things, it moves in and out across the life course. So we may experience well-being highly in an earlier life that may dip in midlife, as has been known to happen. It may dip further in older age and then increase again in very late old age, uh, often referred to as the well-being paradox when we actually come to rely on non-kin and perhaps carers. So some of the well-known influencers of, of well-being that have been sort of alluded to this morning are, are these, you know, our, st our status, you know, do we have partners or do we live alone? Do we have or do we not have children? Are we working or retired? And what's our level of income? What kind of housing do we live in? And there's well-documented evidence here that living alone, social isolation and loneliness are all associated with poorer cognitive function and well-being. But I think, again, it's worthwhile reiterating has, as has been said this morning, that these are all very separate concepts and they do, they're not linear. So living alone does not necessarily lead to social isolation or loneliness. They may interact, but they may not interact. And so, um, you know, so high up in the agenda now is well-being, which is which is good, that it is actually being included in, in economies definitions. And I think I thought it was very interesting that, you know, you have these economies of well-being alliances now, such as that between Scotland, Iceland and New Zealand, which are seeking to broaden the definition and the measurement metrics um, to include more than GDP in an economy's um, um, value and its wealth. They're actually including well well-being. So looking at the connections between midlife and an older age, we have to again acknowledge that these are very much multi-directional. Um, the social exclusion has been spoken about already this morning and these other concepts and including depression. Um, these again um, may interrelate in both direct and all directions with one another or they may not. They may be they may be experienced in isolation. So but it's well it is well known. In fact, we have we have seen this often that adversities uh, across earlier stages of the life course may increase the risk of loneliness in later life and may in turn increase the risk of social exclusion in later life. So nurturing our social networks across the life course is in fact a very sensible thing to do um, to, to lead to hopefully a better well-being in, in later life. And uh, one Irish participant did that deliberately who um, was married but with no children and moved to a rural area and picked up hobbies um, where they would meet people because they recognised that, that it was through children that people made their social networks. They didn't have any, so they, they picked up on a number of other hobbies um, to um, cushion themselves, if you like, in older age. But there's no doubt that our social networks may shrink and certainly recalibrate as we get older, for sure, um, for a number of reasons, either because of personal details for us or for our others that we relate to. So we or our others may experience any one of these, like impaired mobility, vision, hearing. Um, there may be reductions in tra public transport. We can't drive anymore, perhaps. Um, we might relocate, our peers might relocate, um, some of our peers will in inevitably die. Um, all of these things are going to um, affect our social networks. But it may also just be something as straightforward as the age friendliness of the environments around us. Um, if we don't have or if we don't feel that we have, especially in rural areas, um, um, good footpaths, walking places, um, 
a friendly atmosphere, a place that we can walk without fear, then we may, that may stop us going out. So we have to address these issues of what makes communities and geographical landscapes age friendly. So looking again at these social networks and well-being, um, we've already looked at how um, having a partner or being married is it, you know, supposed to put, put it at less risk of loneliness than those who are single, widowed or divorced. But it's very important that we take these in context because this is not always the case and being alone does not equal loneliness. So we have various contra, you know, contrasting participant quotations here. An Irish participant saying she enjoys her own company, doesn't get lonely. Now she's saying this at midlife, that may be different in older age. Uh, we have another Irish participant saying she's straight into her neighbours uh, because she hates being on her own. But again, we have to take this in context because this particular participant um, had an intellectual disability and had good reason, in fact, to, um, to not wish to be alone. And again, a Swedish participant saying that she's in good health just now, so she likes being on her own. That may, that may change over the life course. And, um, and also this difference between uh, the perception of rural and non-rural. There's a perception that um, the urban will be more lonely, and this is not always the case, but there's a perception there that you cannot speak to people on the street or make relationships so easily in urban areas, but it's easier in, in rural areas. So some examples here of rural networks and reduced well-being and, and enhanced well-being, because I want to just demonstrate what's so different about rural. So in an absence of social networks, we can see that, it's, again, the literature tells us that all of these factors here put, it as, put us at a higher risk um, if we are uh, experiencing any of those in rural areas. And right down from, you know, not just things like um, it could be poor health, it could also be something as straightforward as your, as your climate. And here's an Irish participant saying that who lives in an island, who lived in, lives in an island, saying how lonely she becomes when she sees the last ferry leaving in the evening, particularly during winter when it's very dark. And uh, we have to remind ourselves that loneliness. Sorry, and, Alison, you have five minutes. Okay. We have to remind ourselves that loneliness is not always physical, but sometimes social and emotional. And if you perceive this person actually lived quite close to a small town, but didn't see anyone from where she lived, although she lived in a very scenic area and felt extremely socially isolated. But there's also, we have to remind ourselves that rural can be very enhancing to well-being. And a Swedish participant put this very well, you know, speaking about this, um, this perception we have, which is often very real, of close-knit communities of watching out for one another. She believes it's not the same in the cities. Now, again, that's a bit of a generalisation because cities be can become more nuanced themselves into districts. But there are robust links between rural social relationships and well-being. And we have again to remind ourselves that these social relationships and well-being don't always come from humans. They can come from non-human forms in the, in the form of animals and uh, environment and flora and fauna, as this Irish participant who was an organic farmer stated. So looking at loneliness, we have to um, acknowledge that it's not something that's either, you know, it's, it's not exclusively for females or for older people. And we've seen this a lot during this pandemic when, we've, when people have been complaining about being feeling socially isolated and lonely in the younger generations and of both genders. But there's a, there's a great need, I think, for us to have a unified definition as to what we mean, because this actually affects policy. And in one study, it shows that rural older Irish adults defined loneliness in terms of boredom, inactivity and felt insecurity, whereas the Swedish participants defined it in terms of the absence of others. And what that does is it creates a social asymmetry, a discrepancy if you like. And if we try to um, apply the same policy responses to address these issues of loneliness in different contexts and within different cultures, then they're clearly not always going to work. It may depend upon the types of um, societies these are. 
And because this particular workshop is addressing both on and offline, I thought it worth mentioning that there are links, of course, between positive links between the frequency of internet use and well-being, but a big difference between the actual quality of content. And again, we've seen this within this pandemic about GPs complaining that they can't have meaningful conversations with their patients online. So where do we go to from here? Well, we do recognise that loneliness is very serious. It's a killer and can lead to any of these and many more um, conditions and certainly linked to cognitive impairment at midlife and older age. And um, for those of you who are interested, I can send on these slides um, afterwards. And then that way you'll actually be able to um, click on to this um, video link here by Pinker, um, which actually looks at the island, the, the Italian island of Sardinia and why it houses so many centenarians. And uh, she found out that it was due to social relationships. So I want to just finish by looking at what could be some of the societal interventions for later rural life uh, that may work. Well, we have to learn to create social engagement opportunities, first of all, that people can buy into. We have to learn to reduce the fear of the outside, be that outside crime, a virus such as we have now, or any form of the other that we don't recognise. Yes, we have to age digital engagement. Oops, something's happened. Oh, there we are. Um, we have to also, I think, facilitate coping mechanisms across the life course to appraise this concept of happiness, which I think is very interesting, uh, because if we're expecting to be hedonistically delighted with our, our lives from cradle to grave, I think we're always going to be disappointed. And I think that's something that we have to um, perhaps teach uh, in order to learn to live well alone, a, an idea, a concept I think we should be teaching people, not even from midlife, but much earlier across the life course, we have to learn to live alone. And that will serve as well in later life. Um, one of the things that could work there would be more intergenerational connections, and that's actually been addressed already by Stefan in Homophily. Um, you know, and this is already happening in a number of societies where we're putting older people in touch with younger people. And actually, because I believe, uh, and I know that Stefan, again, may, may his, his findings found a little bit different, I think this may actually enhance well-being, but the findings have, have pointed this way. And I, my finishing quote there is, uh, and I wanted to finish in that because I think it's a very good um, quotation, the usefulness of interventions, policy interventions, should widely depend on the identification of contextually relevant cultural psychological aspects. In other words, we can one size does not fit all. We have to look at all the nuanced approaches of these different cultures and different contexts in order to address um, the and how to fix social relationships so that they, they lead to greater well-being. Okay, thank you. What we're doing in this presentation is to sum up in a 17 minutes talk the work that we have been doing in three years. So apologies if you know you are looking into you know more details about our study, but the aim here is just to give you a brief overview. Okay, as I mentioned uh, um, earlier, um, the aim, uh, the overall aim of uh, the research is to investigate the impact of offline and online social network on older people's well-being and to explore the role of smartphone and social networking sites used on older people's social inclusion and uh, intergenerational relationship. Right. Um, to pursue these aims, we actually adopted a quite uh, complex uh, method, set of methodological um, of, um, methods that include uh, the analysis of cross-sectional and longitudinal data, the analysis of experimental data, the analysis of big data, and of data from focus groups and qualitative interviews. Within the context of this project, we carried out three self-standing studies, which we call the ANSI study, 
which is a, a study correct, connect, co conducted using an experimental design. The house study, which involves the analysis of big data, and the ICA study, which, is, uh, uh, which implies the collection of 40 qualitative interviews uh, on older people in the uh, 10 uh, villages which were first in Europe, uh, uh, for which we in adopted a very strict lockdown in Italy. Right. Um, I think that we can sum up uh, uh, the research that we have done so far in three main research trends. Research that belongs to the stream uh, on older people, ITC, ICT and social network insights use in Europe, older people, social media use and well-being, older people, social relations and well-being. Okay, and when focusing on the first research stream, what we tried to do was to describe older people's ICT use in Europe, on the one hand, and to investigate older people's smartphone use in everyday life. To describe older people's ICT use in Europe, we use data from the Eurostat and from the Italian National Statistical Institute and we focus on PC, internet and social networking size uptake. And the key findings from our study was that we found very marked differences in prevalence rate and also strong, strong the existing of a very strong grey digital divide throughout Europe. Also, we found that socially disadvantaged older people were less likely to be ICT user. To address the second substream, a research substream, that is the investigation of older people's smartphone use in everyday life, we implemented two different uh, studies, self-standing studies. The Hauser study and the Ilka study. So the Hauser study implied the setting up, the uploading, on 30 older people's uh, smartphone of an app which allowed to understand the type of applications and the time people were spending on the smartphone and then you know the issues that were raised in this very first part of the research were looked more deeply in three focus groups and 20 face-to-face -face interviews but also to address this very same issue, we carried out a qualitative study. This qualitative study was carried out during the lockdown. So as I mentioned before, we interviewed 40 older people living in the first European red zone, which is located in the southern part of Milan. The key findings from these two studies were that older people use smartphones for a limited amount of time and mainly to use WhatsApp. We could not find any evidence for technological stress. Also, we found that smartphones are conceived as means to exchange mutual practical support mediate face-to-face -face interactions and strengthen reciprocal affective bonds. And uh, this is the only quote uh, I'm going to show you in this talk. It's from a 65 years old man living in one of these 10 small villages. Please, I'd like to remind you that we have a very strict lockdown here 
in the northern part of Italy for a long time. So we could not go, go out from our homes unless we really needed to. But this old man says, the smartphone was of great help to me. Perhaps it was because I wanted to know how they, my family and friends were doing and how they were spending their time. It was the same for them, to be honest. The desire to stay connected wasn't just mine. Social calls almost became mutual ad. The dismay was appeased by the phone, which helped me not to be seriously isolated during the lockdown. Right. We talk about we talk now about the second research stream, which is social media use and well-being. So on the one hand, we wanted to explore association between older media, older people's social media um, use and um, life satisfaction, but also going behind behind the study of association and trying to understand the causal impact of all the people's social media use on loneliness, social isolation, and cognitive performance. When addressing the first sub um, stream, we use the Eurostat data and data from the Italian National Statistical Institute. And we focus on social network network insights use as well as social messaging apps. And we also perform a quite detailed court analysis. And the key message was that uh, overall, we found positive associations between social media use and life satisfaction in old age. After controlling for demographic, social economic factors and health condition. Right. The situation is actually not quite clear when uh, I'm disentangling and trying to understand the causal impact of social network size use on loneliness and social isolation. As I mentioned before, we carried out an experiment uh, which involved, involved one, 180 participants. So we randomly assigned these participants to three treatment groups the Social Network Insights Training Group, the Lifestyle Course Training Group, and a waiting list, a control group. And so what we found, and we're interested in assessing the short-term and long-term effects. And these are preliminary findings, because we're still working on these findings. So when looking at the short-term effects, we found that for all groups, we found small, but statistically significant improvements between pre and post treatment assessments in loneliness and social isolation. But we did not find statistically significant differences between groups. So we cannot say that, you know, having attended a course on social networking sites could improve or have any impact um, on uh, older people's life satisfaction. When looking at uh, the long term, we found statistically significant differences for social isolation only, meaning that trained older people were less socially isolated. We are also trying to assess the causal effects of social exercise use on quality performance focusing on executive functions, meaning processing speeds, inhibitory control, etc. And these preliminary findings suggest that uh, we, are, we did not find any statistically significant differences between the pre and post treatment assessments. Also, for the social network insights and waiting group list, we did find some significant improvements in processing speed only when controlling for personality traits. Last but not least, 
The third research stream is on social relations and well-being. And here, what we wanted to do was to explore the relationship between social capital and changes in social capital and active aging, and also to analyze the impact of changes in social network characteristics on older people's well-being. And we are actually still working on this on this second substream, and I'm not going to show you any results yet. And so going back to the... Sorry, Manuela, you have five minutes left. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, so talking about the relationship between social capital, changing in social capital and active aging, we used shared data and uh, um, when looking at social capital, we focus on social networks, the presence of a partner and similar indicators of social, net of social capital. And we're talking about active aging. We look at participation in social activities, such as volunteering and charity caregiving and paid work. Key findings from this study are that social network size and changes and increase in social network size are positively associated with initiation of activities and that receiving social support may actually stimulate reciprocity caregiving. So what, what are the key findings so far of a take-home message? Well, I think that we found strong evidence that despite of the increase in ICT uptake, only a minority of selected older people are social media users. And one, one may wonder, but is it an issue? We do think it's an issue. Given that social media use is associated to life satisfaction, exclusion from social media use may be an additional uh, risk of social exclusion, especially for socially free older people. And as we have seen in our study that was carried out during the lockdown, ICT use is a means for strengthening social bonds. However, at the moment, we cannot, you know, we are still trying to understand the causal nature of the relationship between social media use and well-being. Our works have very many limitations that we addressed in the papers that we have already published. I think that, you know, it's currently quite difficult to research online social network with the, with the existing survey data. And also to explore more in depth other, the impact, uh, the relationship between you know, social media use and other indicators of well being. We just focus on life satisfaction for a time being. I actually fear that we underestimated, the, we didn't pay enough attention to you know, the role that gender plays. So this is definitely something that we will do in future research. And, uh, you know, a, an issue that still remains an open issue. I mean, this ICTs and social media use, is it a means to, you know, overcome the ur urban rural divide or that actually can prevent, uh, you know, um, improving the quality of life for people who live in urban, in uh, rural areas? And this, I think, also to answer this question, I think we also need to be aware of the difference spread of the internet connection. And this is actually an issue, an issue. Last, I'd like to thank you, Emma, for, and also Daniele, Zaccaria, because together with me, they contributed to the conceptualization and the writing of a research grant. We wouldn't be here without their, the effort that they put in conceptualizing and writing the grant. So I'm really grateful to them. 
I'm also grateful for the, fund the Italian um, Fondazione Cariplo to the study participants. Um, sometimes we overlook the contribution that uh, the journal referees provide, but I'm grateful for the input because they contributed to improve uh, the quality of our work. I'd like to thank the past and current team members and my 76, last but not least, my 76 years old mom. Thank you.